Hello and welcome to Please Don't Send Me Into Outer Space, the podcast intent on exploring all that science fiction and fantasy has to offer one movie at a time. My name is Joel. My name is Sarah. My name is Aaron. And I'm Gina. The movie this week is The Lost Boys from 1987, directed by Joel Schumacher. Schumacher. Anyways. Uh, written by Jan Fisher, James Jeremias, and Jeffrey Boehm. Starring Jason Patrick, Corey Haim, Diane Wiest, er, er, uh, sorry, Edward Herman, Bernard Hughes, Kiefer Sutherland, Jamie Gertz, Corey Feldman. Uh, is there anybody else I need? To, oh, yeah. And starring Tim Capello as himself. <laughs> the, 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 the VIP, the, the MVP of the movie, Tim mm, Capello. Mm. It's a, it's a, it's a Tim Capello vehicle. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, our special guest here is Gina. Hey, Gina, how you doing? Hey. I am so happy to be here talking about this wonderful motion picture. I know. I'm excited. I'm honestly excited for you. I've been trying to get uh, Patrick from Kill by Kill to. Uh, commit to doing it on your guys' podcast. Now, I just uh, I don't think he he's into the idea yet. Uh, hopefully, a year or so down the line, when you guys are mid Nightmare on Elm Street, you know he'll finally <laughs> submit. But I'll work, I'll work him over. I'll work him over a yeah. little bit. In the meantime, why do you like this movie so much? Well, uh, I will tell you that um, I have a theory that The Lost Boys is the very first horror movie. That was specifically designed and marketed to appeal to teenage girls. And I will tell you why I believe this, because this movie came out exactly four days after my 15th birthday. And it was heavily, heavily marketed in teen magazines and, and, and on MTV. And it was just very much a, you know, here are the next, you know, hot teen idols. They're all playing vampires. And, and I never, to my knowledge, I, I've never seen a horror movie pushed that hard on on a female audience, let alone a young female audience. Now, obviously, with with vampires, they they you know have a certain sort of you know, very much a sexual appeal to women, but this one for like again like a, a very much a, a a you know high school age audience, it's very much made with them in mind, and yeah. and they. And they did not. They they you know they did not miss a trick. It worked so well. I, I just I just I completely bought into every aspect of this movie. <laughs> nice. I think it worked on another generation too. It was the generation of younger <laughs> sisters that had an mm-hmm. older sister that were that age when this came out were like oh, yeah. introduced to it. And I I wasn't. I didn't have an older sister, but one of my friends did. And she was way into this movie too, even though she was younger than when it came out. Yeah, it's it's definitely riding on that. I feel that this movie lands well, but lands better with women than with men. And and I I think it is because it's very much made with the female with the with the female gaze in mind. I mean, there is there is you know, you. Know, a woman in it, or say a a girl in it is, is Jamie Gertz, but she has kind of a you know I hate to say kind of a virginal sort of look to her. She's not aggressively you know, sexual or anything like that. And, you know she's kind of the nice girl, but you know, you've got it, it's just you know you've got her and you've got like that it's just straight up male eye candy all over the place. <laughs> yes. It was, yeah, it was like the heartthrobs of that time, all of them put together side by side without shirts on or something. Like, yeah, it was, it was like, what if we made the outsiders go to Transylvania? That was, that was, that was this, that was this movie. 
And then we all dress him up like Adam Ant for some reason. We we don't know. <laughs> I, I don't I mean one thing that's always been very puzzling to me about this movie is that they they're all presumably have been turned into vampires fairly recently. But for some reason they're all dressed like Victorian era pirates and they have like yeah. the, the velvet frock coats and I'm like, where did you get these clothes? I wanna know because I wanna go there. Yeah. <laughs> There's one with, like, tassels. There's one with, like, double-breasted, like, looks like Civil War era buttons on it. Yeah, even the little kids. Uh, uh, oh, God, what's the little boy's name? Um, Laddie. Laddie. Laddie, who has, like, one, literally one line in the entire movie. Um, <laughs> he, he, he's got some sort of, like, yeah, like some sort of child Civil War soldier yeah. uniform. <laughs> like, and, and, and you know, and they show they specifically have a shot of his missing child poster. So he just disappeared recently. So That's clearly, it. Santa Carla has some sort of you know very very you know well stocked vintage clothing store. <laughs> yeah, they got a little bit of everything for for everybody on that boardwalk. You know, you, you, there there was a huge variety of of objects. Just there are store weird looking objects and stores at at. You know, just the the slight walk yeah. they did. You have like the the Frog Brothers, whose parents were in a comic book store, and the parents are like hippies who are constantly passed out. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just, yeah. I, I love, I love that they like they, they absolutely do not explore this in any way. But there's like one point where they're running the comic book store and they're like fourteen, yeah, and the parents much. are just like completely zonked out in the background and and another reason that i this is, movie is very dear to my heart is because i grew up near a a beach town with an amusement park and and it's very it's dead on that sort of itinerant you know everybody kind of gathers you know at nighttime and then like after a certain hour it's abandoned and it's kind of creepy and it's kind of cool at the same time and they really i mean i was it was i was on the east coast and this is supposed to be california but it's you know it, it all when you a beach town is a beach town they all look the same and and i just that that's you know it's not a setting other than like jaws that you see a lot for for you know a horror movie and i and i really enjoyed that particular aspect of it yeah, that's true, huh? I'm trying to think of any other time I've ever seen that without it being an aquatic-based monster. That's interesting. So, uh, Sarah, this is all Santa Monica, or no, it was Santa Cruz-based, you Santa Cruz, yeah. I, I lived in Santa Cruz for a year after high school, and they have a boardwalk in Santa Cruz that is a huge tourist attraction, and you can tell from, if you've been to Santa Cruz before, right away, like the skyline where they've got the statue riding in one of the buckets or whatever, mm -hmm. that that tram you see all along the Santa Cruz boardwalk, it goes above it. Um, any vampires up there? No, I didn't see any. <laughs> no. How about uh, gre greased up saxophone guys? Well, you know what? I didn't hang out after dark really that much. Oh, yeah, that's when they come out. Well, that's why you survived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I still believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's the end of the podcast, folks. Uh, yep. Great talk, great talk. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, um, that Tim Capello. I, I think it's oh, so... Oh, oh sorry, Kim, please. I was going to say, we, we could just skip right to Tim Capello. I mean, that's, that's you know, if you've seen this, you know, a half a second of this movie, you, you, you know this scene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, before uh, what uh, we did a couple of activities before uh, we watched the movie here before we got on the phone here, and we also watched a couple of videos uh, just to you know uh, we were looking specifically for music videos that like had clips of like the Lost Boys in it, and we we didn't get to that point, but like there were two things we saw. We saw uh, actually three things. There was a comedy clip where somebody had taken the footage from the movie with Tim Capello grinding and greased up, you know, blown through his saxophone, and <laughs> they edited out Star, so it just looked like Michael was staring at him the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and they put it on a loop, so he's just, like, gyrating over yeah. and over again, and he's just, like, staring. And, <laughs> and his brother's trying to move his face away from him. <laughs> Yep. Uh, the so other, good. <laughs> so good. The other thing was a <laughs> made me so happy. <laughs> an SNL uh, short uh, that featured 
uh, what's the name? John Ham. John Ham as a character who what was the character? The sexy name? sax man, Sergio. Sergio. Oh yeah, he yeah. was supposed to be pretty much directly based on him. <laughs> so much Sergio. <laughs> you know. And that was great. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, uh, Tina Turner live on stage dancing around with Tim Capello's blowing in, blowing the sax there. He's not quite as uh, shirtless. Like, I, I think they... Like they, a vest on or something. Yeah, they dressed him down because they don't want to take him away from the, the lady of the hour. But, mm. you know, you could tell it's him because uh, as... What'd you say, Aaron? <laughs> oh, earlier when we were talking... Yeah, um, it just... Yeah, it seemed like he, he'd walked right off the, uh, the set of the movie and on, directly onto Tina Turner's stage to... Mm. Continue gyrating and playing some yeah, sax. If you, if you haven't seen this movie, basically it's about less than, less than a half hour into it. There, the uh, the hero of the movie, Michael, played by Jason Patrick, goes to uh, goes to hang out at the the beach near where he is and his family who just moved, and uh, there's a concert going on, and the concert. Uh, has the rare where the the lead singer is also a saxophone player, which I don't think I've ever seen that before. No, that's a, um, that's a yeah, lot that's, of pressure on one person's shoulders, and, and his lungs. When you think about yeah. it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he has to sing and then stop singing and play a couple bars on the saxophone, then sing it again. And and this is a uh, a, a musician named Tim Capello. Uh, he has a very iconic look. Um, he sort of looks a little bit like, like a male stripper and a little bit like someone you've seen in a, in a Mad Max movie. He, he's like, <laughs> is he wearing spandex pants or is he wearing leather pants? Leather. Definitely. He's wearing leather, leather pants, no shirt. He is oiled up, which, you know, when you go to the beach, you, you don't want to be there when the wind's blowing around and you're just covered <laughs> in sand you're just got like a cracked glaze of sand on you he's got this long curly hair and a chain around his neck like chains. like he was just he was just let out of a dungeon earlier that evening. <laughs> real life chains <laughs> to go play the saxophone and this teen and, and he's playing this sort of synthesizer butt rock song um it's called i still believe you can find it on uh, on spotify uh and these kind of teen kind of punkers and metalheads and you know sort of a mesh of alternative for the 80s teenagers with the spiked hair and a couple of them and they are they're rocking out man they, they love this saxophone yeah. heavy pop music they're just like head banging and moshing and i'm like uh, what song were they actually oh, playing <laughs> what song did they play for these kids speaks with them you know that saxophone just <laughs> yeah because it's, it's sort of like i'm sort of thinking of the scene in <laughs> friday 13th part four where Crispin Glover is dancing to some sort of like very much a a, a you know, adult you know, you you light adult rock song and mm-hmm. in all actuality when they were filming the scene he was dancing to Back in Black mm. <laughs> and, then, and 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 I just need I was like because it, it's it's very possible that the crowd scenes because this is it's, it's a pretty common thing that in a movie where a concert takes place that the actual performance scenes are filmed separately from the concert goers the audience reaction scenes i'm thinking okay they they've got to be they've got to film these shots at a different time with different music playing. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> like, head banging to the no saxophone way. man yeah there's no <laughs> way these kids are like like you know acting like it's the sex pistols in 78 on the <laughs> 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 it's like greasy sax player up there uh, I think that uh, what actually happened is that guy was out there playing, and they they couldn't take the cameras off him, so that's why he became part of the movie. I think it saying. feels like it feels like he was probably, and I'm sure this is something anybody could look up a, a local musician, and somebody presumably Joel Schumacher just liked his look and and wanted to put him in this movie. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He hijacks the movie for a couple of minutes there. I mean, you're not... You notice that they're looking at each other, but you also just... It's such a hard image to forget. <laughs> that you're just like, there's this person. It's almost like a caricature. So what's this What's this movie about now? I don't... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's like when we watched Buckaroo Banzai, we found out... At the end, that they're actually walk marching to uh, Uptown, Girl. Uptown Girl, and they put that song in later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
So good. So, no, this movie's actually about vampires. It's not about a sexy saxophone player who's not very sexy, but he's supposed to be. <laughs> would have been would have been funny if, if he was actually like the head vampire. Yes, that's what I was <laughs> just thinking. <laughs> I think I think Schumacher maybe wanted him to be after he. <laughs> After he filmed those yeah, scenes. He wanted a lot of things. I was just thinking, <laughs> what if he's glamoring this audience into oh. thinking he's good? Well, at the end, Grandpa says all the damn vampires. I mean, that means there must be a bunch, you know, oh, yeah. they necessarily oh, yeah. got all of them. Maybe. Ooh, that's true. Sure. Yeah, mm. on, oh, a different coven, perhaps? Yeah. Coven. Coven. <laughs> So do we need to explain what this movie is about? I, I feel like it's definitely, if it's, you know, under the category of if you, if, even if you haven't seen it, you, you, you know it. I mean, you know what it's about. You know all the beats of it. You know, you could probably get, I mean, it's been so referenced. Like, I, I was actually, I was reviewed, um, uh, the new, uh, the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, the new Netflix show. Oh, yeah. And there's, there, there's a reference to, there's a reference to it in that. Um, and it's, it's very, you know, it's just like, again, you don't have to have seen it to, to, to get it. Yeah. It's like part of the pop culture. Yeah. I, well, I mean, I feel like it is for a certain, people of a certain age. I don't, you know, I wonder. That's what I always wonder about. Things that just seem to like come naturally as, as references for, for people like us. Like Aaron was saying that the, you at the comic book store handing over a comic. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, delivering the line it might this ju- might just save your life. Is that what he said? Oh yeah, man. That that Corey Fieldman line is like, I yeah, I use that line. Not I don't use it all the time, but they're the you know uh, among the right people. Yeah, you know. <laughs> if I'm sell- if I'm selling them a vampire comic, I'll just be like, you know, yeah, this just might save your life. You know. <laughs> I was gonna say, do you, do you talk in that really uh, unnecessarily deep voice that he oh, yeah. has? Oh yeah. <laughs> But I've 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 been to some comic book stores where I've seen some guys behind the counter who definitely have the frog brother look going down. You know, mm. they're just well, they just kind of glare. They kind of yeah. glare at you. Yeah. Like the whole time yeah. There. yeah. Do you have uh, Invincible <laughs> issue one eighteen? That's a serious comic, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't think it is. Uh, I definitely like how Corey Haim is like, uh, you know, picking apart their comic book store when he goes in there and he's like, you can't have this issue of Superman next to this one. They haven't even found Red Kryptonite yet. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, <laughs> I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I would just want to jump over to a completely different set. Like we haven't really picked a subject to stay on, but I just want to talk about the way Corey Haim was dressed in this movie. Because, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, we, need to, we need to talk about. I definitely if if uh, this movie was remade today, if they did not make Sam his character just openly gay, they they would be such a cop out. <laughs> yeah, because I, I mean I don't know how to put it delicately. This character reads as very gay, yeah. and oh, yeah. and and not in a, not in like a in a way that was meant to to like you know mock his character. It's just you know he was very you know fussy about his clothes. He kind of had this sort of like you know new wavy kind of you know pink floral shirt with the sleeves rolled up kind of oh, thing, yeah. which you would you would never have seen in a in a suburban high school. Again, he's supposed to be like fourteen or fifteen, maybe, and and. You would not have seen that in most high schools in the in the late eighties, and we need to mention the fact that he has a sexy poster of Rob Lowe on his bedroom wall, and <laughs> and, and, and to the, I mean the, the the camera holds on it long enough for you, for the audience to see it. I mean it's in the background, yeah. but you can definitely see it, and it's you know it's it's something you'd see in a teenage girl's room, honestly, and and and. It's just, you know, but again, nobody remarks upon it. I, I don't think it's supposed to be anything that's supposed to be comical. It's just, okay, well, is is he supposed to be gay? Well, all right, fine. You know, I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I'm not comfortable saying that, you know, that he is definitely gay, but I feel like that he's coded as. Mm-hmm. And, you know, which is, which yeah. is, you know, might be, you know, might be an interesting element to add to this movie, and that you know, and if he was, and it wasn't supposed to be a big deal, it wasn't relevant to the plot that that he just was. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's just a, a, like, yeah. What you can definitively say is that he is not 100% straight, and that's just fine, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's all you have yeah. to say about the character. And, and like, when it comes to uh, sexuality in the movie, it's it's all about Michael. Nobody cares about what, what uh, poor little Sam's up to, you know? They're, they're letting him figure himself out. He, he's trading in between being mature and acting, you know, being witty and, and uh, like, uh, what was I going to say? He was, he, he seemed like the, you know, into teenager type age. And then he's uh, upstairs taking his bubble bath and, uh, you know, has to call mom because he's scared of the horror comics. So we don't really, <laughs> we don't really know what's well, going we- on. Well, the interesting thing is, is that when they wrote the the original script for this, um, Sam and the, the Frog Brothers were supposed to be younger. They 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 wanted this to be they wanted this to be more lighter and more kind of like the Goonies. Mm-hmm. Um, so they the original script they were always supposed to be about ten or eleven. So I feel like they kind of didn't didn't update this, the entire script to because yeah you're right he here's time but yeah but it's normal for you know a 14 year old to kind of be in this sort of you know half you know teenager half adolescent phase but you know and again you know there's some it, it is you know done well like there's a scene what I always thought was kind of you know funny and charming at the same time is when the Frog Brothers. Um, after they, they put, they kicked the one vampire into the bathtub full of holy water. Oh no, the dog, the dog knocks him into the, the tub full of holy water. They are, you know, they're just, they fall on the ground and they're like holding on to each other and just screaming and crying. And it's just such a, it's <laughs> such a natural, charming reaction yeah. for two brothers who are really still just little kids. Oh, just yeah. like, just. Just holding each other and just sobbing. It's just, it's just like so funny. Yeah, that was definitely so believable. That was also noticeable to me this time viewing it as well. That that just that moment of like, oh, here it goes. (laughs) Hold on for dear life. (laughs) And uh, this is the first time I've seen this movie like four times now. Like probably the first time a long time ago, and then three times in the last like four years. I feel Uh, me and Sarah just watched it for the first time within the last year. Uh, or she watched it for the first time within the last year, so we we've watched it twice now together. And uh, I gotta say, uh, oh, the the bathroom part, like this is the first time I noticed that that bathroom gets very large after they do push that vampire into, <laughs> into the holy water. Well, well, they need to they they need to you know something to contain you know the gallons and gallons of you know liquid the vampire. <laughs> It just toilet. sprays out of every <laughs> pipe in the house, which yeah. I, I never quite made sense to me, but he just turns to sludge. <laughs> no two vampire dies alike. <laughs> oh yeah, there are some there 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 are some pretty, pretty you know, I'm gonna use a word from the eighties, bitchin' vampire kills in this. Oh yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Yeah, this is a movie that I only saw for the first time this year, and it was because when I was younger, I wasn't allowed to watch it. I had heard about it, and one of my aunts, one of my cool aunts had told me about it, but it was something that, like, once I got old enough to be able to watch, like, I kind of forgot, and that was my loss. <laughs> I kind of feel yeah. It's like... a it's a, it's so it's such a fun movie. It's not scary at all. I mean, I don't I don't think it's scary. It, it's no. maybe a little creepy in points, but but it's just really fun. Yeah. Everybody in this movie just seems like they are having the time of their life, and 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 I love that in a movie when the actors just look like they're enjoying themselves. Yeah, totally. I hope so. The only one that I never got any sense of, like, I'm having a good time from is Jason Patrick. But, I, you know, it might have been the way his his character had to be, mm. you know, just... Dis- yeah, I mean, he's a little, he's a little, uh, he's a, you know, kind of smoldering. That's mostly his, uh, his, his, his direction in the script, I think, is to smolder and, 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 <laughs> you know, look like he's, you know, really hungry all the time. Yeah, I, I, I think that, I, I, I think that the, I think that he does really well in the scene, the first scene, the initiations over Michael scene, where you could, I mean, he's really, really struggling to, to, you know, not go, go all, you know, all in and attack these like beach punk rockers who are rocking out to Aerosmith? Run DMC Aerosmith. <laughs> the, um, there, there's, yeah, there's the credits, the Aerosmith. 
the credits, uh, Gina, refer to these uh, actors as surf Nazis. One through five. One through five. Sure. <laughs> okay. Because if there's anything that the you know, white supremacists are into, and surfers, yeah. it's just Aerosmith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's another miss. Like a like a a point of reference that they're making about the youth culture at the time, where it's like, no, not really though. That's yeah. not really a thing. Yeah. It seems, yeah. Like, I just don't see a bunch of kids coming together, like, lighting up a big old bonfire and like, you know what? Aerosmith right now. And yeah. the, other, the other kid looks at me like, you're right, man. Yeah. <laughs> Let's totally headbang to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get close together and headbang to Aerosmith next to this fire. Yeah. Have a, let's have a mosh pit with six people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a <I> campfire. <laughs> Conveniently far away enough from everyone yeah. so we can get murdered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, he's really good in that scene. He's just barely holding it together. And, and that's what the whole movie is about, is him just trying to keep this... You know, the sudden urge he has to kill people under control. And, and and I think he, it's a little, he kind of plays it a little bit like he's a junkie and he doesn't want to get to the next fix. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was intentional. And, and again, that's, that is something that is often done in vampire movies is, is treating it like, like it's something, like it's a, like a metaphor for a drug addiction. So that's fine. Yeah. 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 I also have heard that it's like, this is not something that I believe that uh, I still don't believe uh, that he's also uh, working with his own sexuality, you know, because at first he's immediately attracted to star, but Ooh, there's Kiefer all of a sudden, you know, it's, and so it's like, this is the evil side of my attraction, you know, playing with that kind of thing back then, of course, like, Oh wait, wait, there's a guy, but, but star, uh, but, but I don't know what to feel like. I'm having so much fun, huh. and, and then yeah, I don't. That's I, I've heard I, that I think from, I think from a modern perspective, it's you know that's a that's a reasonable assessment to make. I don't think that was anybody's intention when this movie was made, though. Yeah. That that no. it was it was it was very much a, a mainstream movie. I, I I mean I think again you know, you know, the fact that no one ever actually questions Sam's clothing or that he has a poster of Rob Lowe on the wall. You know, I like I could see why you know, again from you know in hindsight it would read like that. I don't think it was intentional though. True. Yeah, I remember thinking when I was watching it, like, why would he follow them? And I'm guessing it was just to get to know Star. But yeah, there is a couple of point. There are a couple of points where it feels like they're really pushing him, and that he could have had a moment where he was like, "No, I don't want to do this with you guys." Like. <laughs> Well, he was also the new kid in town, yeah. and and you know, st- and, and and instead of one alpha male, you you you've got four alpha males <laughs> in, right. in the same group, and and yeah, that's that could be a little a little overwhelming. Yeah, you know, and also they just you know they probably looked kind of fun what they were doing. I mean, who doesn't want to get into a motorcycle race? Yeah, who doesn't want to hang out in a cave and eat Chinese food all day? I mean, come on. Mm. <laughs> You know, I, I like hanging out in caves. I like Chinese food. I don't know if I want to combo the items. I, I'd be afraid something would drop in there. You know, like some maggots or some worms or, you know, something worse. I don't know. I, I think of that. I, you were saying earlier about the whole comic book store thing. Yeah. I, I think about that scene every time I eat Chinese food. Every oh. single time. Oh, yeah. You're eating maggots, Michael. How do they taste? And it's like, Oh, no. It's like, oh, movie, why? <laughs> Lost <ruined> boys. <laughs> but yeah, can we can we talk a moment about about Keeper Sutherland in this? Oh, we. <laughs> yeah. He is just, you know, he is smoking hot in this movie. <laughs> and and yeah, I don't even care that he has a mullet. And oh boy, is it a mullet? <laughs> it's it a it is it is it is M. most yeah yeah it. It is like Canadian hockey team mullet. It is. Yeah, I, th- I think if you look up mullet in the dictionary, there's a picture of him yeah, in this movie. I I don't know if he came into the movie with that haircut or that was part of his, his you know the design for his character. But man, this mullet! I don't know if one of the other vampires cuts his hair for him or he found. <laughs> 
a barber shop that has night hours, but this hair is unbelievable. It's you know it enters the room before he does. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and again, like his his first scene is just him on a on a on a, a, a merry go round, and he's got like these boots with the spurs on them, like uh, like Bill Paxton and Near Dark. And again, he's got like the the, the frock coat, and it's just like mm, this one's for the ladies. <laughs> you know? and, just, and, and again, in talking in talking about you know the actors looking like they were having a good time. Time. I mean, he his entire he smirks the entire time, oh, and yeah. it's just yeah, like like he's got kind of this you know I've got a secret smirk going on, and, and like <laughs> best he gig just, ever, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he just he's absolutely enjoying every minute of what he's doing, and that's an interesting thing because a lot of vampire movies. It's you know they don't they don't enjoy being vampires yeah. they're lonely they, they they don't want to hurt people they're, they're just they're just trying to find you know the love of their life from two hundred years ago and and lo and behold <laughs> here's this woman that looks exactly like that woman right. nope David and his friends they are they are loving it they they they, <laughs> just, they are having so much fun and and why wouldn't they yeah. I mean they they. You know, they they probably don't go to school unlike the the kids from Twilight who who go to school for like oh. fifty years straight. Oh, Nobody man. knows why. You know they they, they oh, don't man. have to answer. Yeah, they don't have to answer to any. They don't have to answer to anybody. You know they've got this cool clubhouse. You know in the in the cave. You know why why wouldn't they enjoy themselves? Indeed, indeed. I'm. I'm definitely uh, more of a Jason Patrick fan. In the, I was going to say, who's our biggest crush in this movie? But I feel like Kiefer Sutherland, even though he's not 100% my type, is really like... He, his look is iconic in this movie. Like, you don't even have to know... If someone were to draw a vague image of a person that kind of looked like Kiefer Sutherland, you would know it was him in this movie without it oh, even yeah, having yeah. all the details. And um, I think most people I knew that were more into the movie were more into Kiefer Sutherland, too. But I I guess, I don't know. I I think everybody has their favorite. <laughs> like yeah, the new kids just, on the yeah. block. Like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Everybody had their favorite new kid. <laughs> he's just, he's just a, he's, totally. He's just I, I don't think he's ever been and like the so keeper Sutherland always has a weird sort of he's like James Spader right he's like he, he's you know he's charismatic but in a sort of off-putting way yeah. if that if that, if that makes sense kind of but I mean he, creepy and he, mysterious he, at the same time but yeah, kind of yeah smoldering too it, it, Exactly, and I don't think he's ever been more charismatic than in than in this movie. Totally. And and totally. he's playing, and he's playing like a seventeen year old vampire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he barely has any dialogue. Like like that's that's the that's the interesting thing is the 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 core Lost Boys they don't talk that much. That's they just kind of stand around and look attractive. Exactly. They don't have to, they don't have to work that hard. Yes. Exactly. Seventy for seventy five percent of their. Uh, Dialogue is Michael. Exactly. Yeah. Come here, Michael. Michael, come over here, Michael. <laughs> Join us, Michael. Exactly. You're one of us. You're Michael. one of us, Michael. <laughs> Michael, where'd you get those shoes, Michael? Okay. <laughs> so other other, you know, if I had to pick the sexiest vampire in this movie, I'm just gonna spoil it. It's got to be Edward Herman. No, uh, no. Uh, I, just, I just, yeah, I, I love Edward Herman. Me too. And I was very sad when he passed away. And I think, I, I guess I have, I was looking up like his movie, his filmography, and he's been in all kinds of movies that I had no idea because I hadn't watched them that he was in. And so I was thinking that like, this is, seems like a very unique role for him, but I, it's like every time I see him, I'm thinking, uh, uh, you know, Gilmore. yeah, Grandpa Gilmore. So yeah. yeah, totally. I, I just, I just, I just love that he's basically looking for a vampire stepmom. Nope. Yeah, <laughs> for, yeah. For his vampire sons. <laughs> Gotta help me with my boys. Yeah, that's, what a concept. That's so straight clever. up with the uh, the Peter Pan thing, right? Peter Pan trying to take Wendy to take care of the Lost Boys because he can't be bothered. I think that's what happens, right? You know what? I honestly don't even associate my idea of this movie with that at all. Yeah, but I totally should because they're they're. 
boys who don't grow up or whatever. Yeah, oh yeah, it's definitely it's definitely named for you know it's definitely a Peter Pan reference. Um, and and, and I think that's that plays into why Michael does hang out with them because you know he's kind of it's supposed to be like you know the summer before he was going back to school in a new town it's going to be a drag and you know his you know his parents split up so why not have a little fun by you know hanging off a train trestle (laughs) 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 because you know why not because we're young and stupid yeah Yeah, exactly you fall into infinity afterwards it's pretty great and and land right and land right in your bed. I mean, it's it's really convenient. Mm. You know, you nowadays you have to you know, call Lyft to pick you up from the, the train <laughs> trestle, and take you home, and hope that somebody's home to help you get into your bed. You know, you just kind of you plopped right down. It was it's, it was great. Yeah, and then you got to wear sound flow, uh, sunglasses whenever you want to answer the phone. Uh, what was I? Uh, uh, I was thinking about something. I can't remember. Aaron, don't touch me. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, Joel. No, it's all right. I know you're just trying to tempt me with your vampire ways. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad that you're finally now seeing that. Oh, I feel like I have to mention the uh, episode of We Hate Movies that they did where they met, they go off on this tangent about Kiefer Sutherland, which I thought was one of the most hilarious things I'd ever heard. The first time I heard it, and he, they mentioned Kiefer Sutherland as a lost boy in it, but <clears> yeah. it's the episode for Taking Lives? Taking Lives, or yeah. The, anyone can draw Kiefer Sutherland is yeah. the joke, yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's where we get our Kiefer Sutherland love. Uh, fifth of the in the south. <laughs> Sorry, are you okay, Joel? No, I, I, when you say, try, try to say Kiefer Sutherland six times fast. Specifically, it's, it's, it's just oh, I mean, yeah, it's it's just a shame because Ke- Keeper Keeper's been phoning it in for a long time, but but you know, in the eighties, he had a very interesting presence in 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 movies. Even when he was like not playing the villain, he still sort of seemed like he could have been playing the yeah. villain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, and it's just you know he always kind of had again like James Spader, he always kind of had that look. Yeah. Yeah, this was definitely like a height for him. The, oh yeah, this time in his career, and I, and I'm sure he. I am sure that everything I know about Keeper Sutherland, he probably hates that. <laughs> that <this laughs> oh, was, I could only that, imagine that, trying to trying that, to get as far as way from. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure that I would say for Jason Patrick, this was probably you know. To at least two people who know Jason Patrick, this is the highlight of his career. And, yeah. and I, I assume that neither of them probably particularly enjoy being reminded that their best role was playing teenage vampires. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that some of them look at Robert, Robert Pattinson's career and it's like, you little son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm trying to think of anything. Was Jason Patrick on a TV show or anything like that? Like the only no, only other thing I know of was Speed Two. Yeah, he he's he did some. You know, he he's done mostly kind of lower budget indie movie. He did he did do a movie uh, some years after The Lost Boys called Rush. Oh yeah, he I was just in, talking um, about uh, an undercover dark and. Yeah, he's a he was. I mean, I don't know that he. I think he's become kind of a uh, a father's rights activist. So oh, he's probably I kind see. of a garbage. Mm. He's probably a garbage person at this point. That's but too bad. Yeah, you know, he. Yeah, yeah, he. Uh, yeah, he kind of didn't really have the career you would expect him to have from something like this. Basically, playing you know the prettiest face in a vampire movie. Yeah, yeah. I the only thing I remembered him from off the top of my head was Sleepers at first. Yes, yeah, he and, was, in, and then again, that was like another. That was another you know, ensemble where right. he was playing against other actors his age, right. like you know, kind of like, kind of like the Lost Boys. But I think we just watched a movie that Eric Clapton did the soundtrack for, and I was like, "It's not, this is no Rush soundtrack or something <laughs> like that." And that's what you were. We talking were talking about. <laughs> about the movie Rush. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I totally forgot it was him because he has a beard in that movie, right? Doesn't he? I believe so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think honestly, I think this was. I mean, if you're looking also at Corey Haim and Corey Feldman, this was probably career peaks for them totally. too. Oh, I mean, yeah. they yeah they 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 did a couple more movies together after this, but but this was this was the big one for them, which is I mean, I, I guess 
guess Kiefer and Jamie Gertz are probably the only ones that really came away with uh, anything, you know, you know, close to a respectable career at this point. Yeah. Well, yeah. Alex, Alex Winter, Alex Winter, um, who plays, who I think maybe has one more line than the actor who plays Laddie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they not give those, they're very economical in the dialogue. They, they, they give the, the titular characters. <laughs> they don't talk a lot. They put, they put the, those wigs on them or whatever and then they expect them just to be shiny. Or the, I say shiny, not meaning, uh, like shiny vampires. I mean, like, pretty for the camera look, look good yeah 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 and they did that splendidly they certainly did let's see Corey Haim and Corey Feldman License to Drive is was the first one that came to mind like Dream a Little Dream uh I think that's it honestly Field, no they did, Fieldman they was did in a, Burbs, they, but but I mean that was separate from Haim oh yeah yeah, they, they together they did a uh, <laughs> uh, let's call it an erotic thriller. Oh. Uh, I, I will not I will not look up the name because no one should seek it out. <laughs> it's, it's <not> good. <laughs> I mean, it's about as bad as you can imagine an erotic thriller starring Corey Feldman <laughs> due to be. I mean, I don't. I mean, that's that's got to be pretty bad because I, I don't think I can think of a single erotic thriller that's ever been like, hey, that was a good movie. But, uh, I'm not really putting much effort into it either. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if your if your audience demands that we that they put the, you know to know what movies is talking about, I will attempt to look it up. But I, uh, I am not no, going to look no. it up right now. It's fine. It'll, it'll be fun homework for uh, our, our for one, some uh, <laughs> our three listeners <laughs> besides us. So I think six listeners. Wow. Wow. No. Uh, <laughs> I think Haim does a really good job in there. I think uh, the Frog Brothers, Feld- Feldman is great too, but I think that guy, whoever the guy who's, you know, the Allen of the Edgar and Allen uh, troop the actor there. actor is Jameson Newlander. I think he did absolutely nothing after this movie. No. He was <laughs> nothing. great though. He works well off of Feldman and oh, vice yeah. versa, so I like that. I was going to say, I think that the sexy vampire thing hadn't really become a full thing. And after this, there was a bunch more that were supposed to be kind of sexy vampire stories. But the thing it reminded me the most of was like True Blood, the True Blood series. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think they really tried to like sex that one up and have the guys without their shirts on and stuff. And it worked. But I don't know if there are any others that really feel... When I was looking it up earlier, I kept seeing other Lost Boy movies, like oh, The yeah. Tribe oh, yeah. or the, something. The, the, oh, yeah, those are those are utterly worthless. I know. Utterly worthless. <laughs> well, Gene was talking about Near Dark, and they, they kind of sec- they try to sex up the vampires in that one as much as they can. But, I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, he's absolutely steaming in that movie. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Paxton? Paxton, yes. Bill Paxton is yeah. absolutely steaming in Near Dark. Like, literally. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, besides that, I mean, Uh-oh. like I am a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a hetero straight male, and if Bill, Bill Paxton in that movie walked off the screen, you know, I think we're making out. Oh, oh yeah, again, he had that, he had that same sort of Kiefer esque charisma, and again, looking like he, you know, could not be happier with what he was doing, just mm. just enjoying every bit of it. Totally, Near Dark such a great movie too. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> I feel like I feel like Near Dark is what you graduate to after after the Lost Boys. The Lost Boys <laughs> that makes a lot of like, sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, there's 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 you know it's it's a little it's a little bloody in scenes, it's a little bit of violence, but it's not it's not that bad. I would I would be comfortable showing this to you know a ten year old. And then you've got Near Dark, which is you know it's very you know, it's darker in style, it's darker in tone, it's you know it, it's a, it's much more violent, but they they are. Somewhat, they're, they're they're very similar in 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 plots and themes. You've got this sort of you know itinerant band of vampires who who uses a female vampire to to lure another you know, to to lure another vampire into their into their fold. Although although I believe, if I'm not mistaken, again you know parallel storylines that she wasn't actually supposed to bring him into their group. She was supposed to kill him. Yeah, and that was and that would have made her a a, a you know a full vampire. 
Yeah. So yeah, they're they're very similar in 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 you know in plot and style and but you know Near Dark does it with you know a lot less of a sense of humor and a lot more brutal. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I would say watch The Lost Boys first, then watch Near Dark. <laughs> Yeah, that's another storyline bit that uh, for some reason I've never picked on before. That Jamie Gertz was uh, supposed to was supposed to finish uh, Jason Patrick off the night that they ended up sleeping together. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, for some reason, I just like uh, I didn't think it was either way around. But when she's like, "I was supposed to kill you that night," I was like, "Oh, well, you turn the tables on that, I guess." Uh, by giving us a, a music video with the, <laughs> you two gyrating together. It doesn't even show well, I mean, what, much. Yeah. Like, it I mean, would you? Yeah, uh, the love scene. Yeah, it's again, it's, it's you know, it's they didn't want to scandalize their young teen audience, mm. so the, you know, it's it implied always works better at, at that age and actually showing it. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. It's it's what a teenager would imagine that a. a Making love for the first time was going to be like, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, you got like you know the, the filmy curtains. You got the perfect soundtrack. Absolutely, one hundred percent. You're with Jason Patrick every time. Yeah, <laughs> of course, obviously. <laughs> I also like Diane Weist. Is it Weist? This character? Weist. Weist. Yeah. In- oh yeah, she's, she's great. She, she kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, of Olive Bell, though. She's got a little bit of an oh. <laughs> I kind of think going on. She's, yeah. she's constantly fretting. She is, you know, she is in full fret mode for the entire, the entire movie. movie. I don't really like her character. Her, she did fine acting, but the character is like, I gotta get a man to like me. <laughs> like, like, there's even a part where, oh, it's when the boys like kind of try to reveal him as a vampire at the dinner, and mm-hmm. it's like. She's like, you guys, you're scaring off a man or something <laughs> like that. And I feel like, yeah, she's just fretting when she isn't talking about her love life. But she was she the one that's in Parenthood? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know her for that, and I think she's a Woody a Allen of, she's, movie. She's a couple Woody Allen movies. Yeah. Yet. She kind of plays a very similar character. Right. Like, like she always looks anxious. Yes. She just kind of has that look. She's got that that anxious mom look. Totally. That yeah. I feel like it's her typecast or something. Totally. Edward Scissorhands. Oh yes, yes, yes. One hundred percent. And I believe she is a uh, nervous mom. She 100%. is uh, John Lithgow's wife in Footloose. Oh, again, totally again, fret, yeah. fretful mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a fretful mom in that. Yeah, this is basically Footloose without all the dancing. <laughs> it's Footloose with vampires. Footloose with vampires. Vampires have been outlawed. <laughs> I'm down with that. <laughs> or maybe not being a vampire has been outlawed. I'm not sure. No tractor fight, though. That's what it was missing. <laughs> Oh man! Vampire, that was amazing. vampire tractor fight. <laughs> I don't know why they would have had. I don't know why they would have tractors in a beach town, but you know, who cares? <laughs> so go into the uh, horror movie aspects of here. Um, I like how they do the the beginning of uh, not revealing who the vampires are by doing the like the camera reaching down to like grab somebody and they get pulled up into the air. They do that a couple of times. Oh yeah, that opening that opening scene is so good. With the with the like the the the, the long kind of pan over the water and then kinda got that slightly menacing soundtrack and oh yeah, it's 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 great. It's so it sets it up really well. Yeah. And later they rip off that the top of that car when that couple's in there. Takes them takes them a minute to notice something's weird, weird's going on. They get lifted out separately. Uh, I don't know about vampire faces. The the creepy vampire face. Yeah, I think I might be. I think that just might be spoiled for me, like because that's that's something that's used, and you know that was a Buffy thing you were saying, right, Aaron? Yeah, they used that in the Buffy show a lot. It's it's not Lost Boys' fault that they use that. I mean, it's a, it's a good idea. You know, kind yeah. Of. You mean like you mean like the actual physical like how their faces look? Yeah, like how it transforms when like they the when makeup is like or something. Yeah, their eyes change and then they get the 
They get through their face. eyebrows. They get their, yep, that's true. Yeah, they do kind of get these weird sort of like, you know, they, their, their cheekbones become even more prominent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, it's like somehow they're more handsome than they were before. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, those vampires are so handsome. <laughs> their, their fangs are, I noticed, are situated on either side of their their front teeth, their two front teeth, instead of where, like, fangs are in the human mouth, you know, with the canines. Yeah, they're kind of more like, they're like, more like, like almost like rats. Yeah. Like the, uh, like the, the teeth are, yeah, the teeth are in front rather than the canines. Yeah, that's, it's a somewhat, you know, traditional vampire look with a few, with a few tweaks added to it. Yeah, it, I I feel like that's a it might make some sort of weird logical choice like oh we don't have to open our mouth as much or something like that but I, I don't they could they could still they could still talk and 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 taunt Michael about why he isn't attacking the surf Nazis with them oh yeah that's the key huh mm-hmm. because when you think about it and a couple I think a couple vampire movies have kind of touched upon it in a humorous way you have have you ever worn like like Halloween fangs. For like a costume, yeah, yeah. you can't not, you can't talk with those things because it, it basically turns your mouth into a saliva factory. Yep. So you 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 cannot you cannot at least you, not not clearly at least you can't talk while wearing those things. So I I think that maybe having them in the front would make it. I mean I'm not saying this is why they they chose this, but I, in in practicalities of vampire physicality, I guess that would it would make more sense. Makes sense to me. You're right. I think the the only person <laughs> I, that I remember talking. Even somewhat well with them is uh, Nicolas Cage when he was uh, in, I forget the name of the film. Vampire's Kiss. Vampire's Kiss. There you go. Because he sounded like half the time he sounded like he was talking to a mouthful of peanut butter anyway. <laughs> <laughs> It really wasn't a, an appreciable difference when he had vampire teeth in. I've seen some funny videos of people talking with the fangs in their mouth, oh, like a, the montage without of like, the ADR. Or yeah, whatever. of like. Uh, True Blood stuff, oh, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like you could. Yeah, everybody talks like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and because they've got okay. like again, you really can't, you can't really close your mouth around them. It's you know, yeah. It's awkward. <laughs> Eric, I want you out of this place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, what do you guys think about the music, the the series of covers that are in this movie? I mean, does it I, I does think it rock? It, it, it's very much of the time. You know, that time being 1987. <laughs> um, the 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 single that got some uh, brief play on MTV was um, it was a song called uh, "Good Times" by um, it was by Michael Hutchins of of In Excess and Jimmy Barnes, who was an Australian. Well, he could still be alive. I'm not sure, but. He was not really well known in the U.S., but he was a very big pop star in Australia. Mm. I I don't know if this was made for the movie. Um, I believe the only movie that was the rather the only song that was made specifically for the movie was um, "Cry Little Sister," which is the which is a song at the opening when they're panning when they're panning over the water. And that's kind of become the song I think most people have have associated with it. Uh, Marilyn Manson did a cover of it not too long ago, and I think that one's held up a little, uh, probably more than any of the other songs on the soundtrack. There's also a cover of uh, "People Are Strange," yeah. which sounds it's it's one of those cover songs. It sounds so much like the original. I'm not quite entirely sure why they bothered. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. You know, other, other than they couldn't afford the doors for the soundtrack. I wondered about that because they have that Jim Morrison poster too in their cave. Um, yeah, and it's and it's Echo and the Bunny Men, which I mean, I, I guess they would have cost a fair amount of money, but I don't imagine they would have cost much less than just getting the rights to the door song. But it right. just it sounds almost exactly like the original. Yeah, I. I was majorly into uh, Michael Hutchins, and I am still a huge fan of In Excess. Like I, oh me too, I love them 100%. so much. And I'm, you know, R.I.P. I'm so sad that he isn't alive anymore. But, um, but I think that there's totally an In Excess type vibe in this movie, and I didn't realize that he did one of the songs. But we did see. I think- 
Go ahead, I'm sorry. We saw some kind of credit, or Joel mentioned it afterwards, but I didn't know which song it was that mm. they were... Yeah, in the movie, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint where we actually hear "Good Time." I, I think it's. I think it's. Um, I think they play it during the um, part of the uh, the motorcycle racing. Oh. I, I, I I think, but you can. I mean, the video is going to be on on YouTube. It was. It got it some. It, it got some. Uh, it's a, like I said. It's a cool song and very extremely eighties. Yeah. Um. But but it, I think it fits the. The vibe of the of the movie well, but yeah, that got some some MTV play. I definitely remember that. Mm. Cool. So, some VJ's favorite. Wait, did they have VJ's in '87? I don't know when that started. Yeah, I think they. Yeah, they still did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I I think we didn't notice the song during that part because we were too busy talking about. Uh, Sarah was immediately like, "They can't race bikes like that on the sand." <laughs> 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 Drive right into the crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're slipping and spraying, spraying, spraying sand on each mm-hmm. other. <laughs> ah. Some some police officer chasing him. Get off the boardwalk. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah, I think if they were down by the shoreline, they might have had an easier time. But it's hard to maneuver a bike in that kind of sand. I had a bike. With my dad when I was younger, a dirt bike that was made for sand and it had wider wheels because it makes turning, it makes controlling it and turning it easier. But, right. Um, but it's like they had a bunch of BMX like stuntmen or something in this. Yeah, they just slapped those wigs because you definitely <gasps> like a mullet see wig yeah. on their hair yeah. flying in the silhouette <laughs> yeah. as they're racing on the beach. So, yeah, stuntmen and flowing oh. wigs. <laughs> God, I love that hair. I love that part where the they break in uh, to their underground lair, and the Frog Brothers are going to go stab them, and they're all hanging upside down, and their wigs are just they're just hanging there. It's beautiful. It's. I, I want to say that's Keeper's actual hair. I, I think he I think he just went for it and oh. and and got it. Like I said, either came into his audition with that hair, <laughs> or or just or just went along with the you. Know, the art director and said, "All right, just you know, you know, business up front, party in the back." <laughs> yeah, this is like his twenty four seven look back then. Yep. I feel like for a period of time, maybe he cut it off later or something. But and was this was he smooching with Julia Roberts when when he had this haircut, or was this pre Julia Roberts? I think this was pre Julia Roberts. I do know that this was the next movie he did after um, Stand by Me. Mm. And it stand, stand by me. He had kind of a kind of fifties greaser kind of hairstyle. Right, yeah. So I feel like I feel like I feel like that would be fairly easy to kind of let grow out into something that could be turned into a mullet. Definitely, yeah. he's got the he's got the ability. Like uh, I, he's not a vampire himself, but I think he's got the hair growing mm-hmm. ability if if necessary. Could he? Could is he not a vampire though? He he could be a vampire. We we just don't know. He's. Certainly, he looks he's aging. Worse. He's aging at a much slower rate. Than oh, most people right. Seem to be. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh, I think there was like a some sort of like device that was supposed to give longevity to their careers and to their usefulness to that particular group of people. And and James Spader like detached his soul from it, so that's why he is in uh, the blacklist, looking the way he is now. But everyone else is is trying desperately to hold on to it. <laughs> uh, I'm writing the screenplay right now. Um, oh, nice, nice. <laughs> he does make you wonder because he had that powerful hair and looking pretty in pink. And mm. if he'd become a vampire after that, he'd probably be aging slower and looking glamorous. Still, we tell you, Spader. Yeah. Oh, remember how how he looked in uh. Ooh, what was that space movie we watched with your mom? Where he's all oh buff? my god, that was hilarious! Yeah, we did an episode on Supernova, Supernova. with my mom. Oh yeah, he was like beefed up like, in that. That was crazy. It's so weird. It is weird. <laughs> it's like I've seen lots of actors get beefed up for roles. For some reason, James Spader beefed up. It, it, it like, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of doesn't compute in your brain, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it but it, it does was not an actual time. Well, you know. <laughs> so, Joel, you were talking about the horror movie aspects earlier. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know. Just didn't well, know if you had anything to elaborate no, on that. I mean, there's some juicy explosions when they start killing those things. I really love that first vampire kill when they they kill poor Ted <laughs> or Marco as his character. Oh is. yeah. 
Uh, and uh, they just everybody gets gooed. They get sprayed <laughs> down. Oh yeah, there's so much. There's like a certain point where everybody just gets covered in in glop in this in this in this movie. It gets very gooey in the last half hour. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Once the sinks and everything else starts blowing, I don't... <laughs> we were watching some TV show there that was happening. I was like, "What? What is this? Is the world trying to tell me my toilet's going to explode or something like this? What's going on?" <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I liked the line when they were they were dragging the uh, the vampires into the house, and the grandpa's just like, you know the rule, right, about filling up the car after you. <laughs> he's like, now you. They're like, no, now you do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we haven't really talked about grandpa. Grandpa's grandpa. like the, <laughs> the great character who just yeah, I, I let you kids go through hell. I knew it was going on the whole time. <laughs> yeah. I can't argue yeah. at, at all. The end of the movie. <laughs> And I just love that the movie just closes on everybody just looking like, what the f-? And then just, like, goes right to mm-hmm. credits. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I want to know, more. I want the movie to go on after that. I want to hear this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and two words, like, you let me bring my children to a town where oh, vampires God. are killing people. Yeah, I feel like there's a whole grandpa <laughs> tale that I want to know too. That oh yeah, said. there's like <laughs> I, I feel like that the I mean I know that there have been um, graphic novels and and comics been also this. I don't know if any of them have involved grandpa, which which seems to me that that you know would seem very right for for a, a separate storyline. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, like is 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 is, is Santa Carla really Salem's lot? You know. <laughs> <laughs> It's like there are way more vampires here than just this, you know, group of teenage boys. I looked it up and there actually is no Santa Carla. Okay. Um there's a San Carlo. San Carlo. Or Carlos. Mm-hmm. Um there's but Santa there's, Clara, obviously. Santa Clara is an actual place, but I think they were just making a fictitious town like like a John Hughes movie. Yeah. Or something. Well, just to, if Santa Santa Carla actually existed, people would be flocking there to go see greased up saxophone players. So they had to yeah. make up a fake city. Obviously, true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, ride ride the roller coaster, see the saxophone player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, possibly get bitten. You know, it's a it's a yeah. night, yeah. and rent any video you want from the video store. Drink drink uh, blood wine from a uh, you know bedazzled bottle. Listen, I don't care how good that blood is; it's still gonna taste like blood. He should have known. Yeah, I <laughs> I just think it's gross every time. I I've only seen it a couple of times now, but both times I'm like, that's unsanitary. It probably would taste gross. <laughs> just, say, just take a big old swig of it, like it's like it's just. Like a wine cooler, and it's like, ooh. And after after that point, that that was the same night he's getting hypnotized about Chinese food actually being disgusting bugs. Like, why are you going to trust Kiefer in any situation yeah. at this point? Don't trust Kiefer. <laughs> never, <laughs> never trust Kiefer. Never. Uh, Mr. Sutherland, write in today if you'd like to dispute these uh, claims against you. Uh, please don't podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> uh, I think I like how Grandpa is a crank, but he's also very chill about so many things. Because you know, like you said, that the whole you know the rule about filling up the gas tank when you use it. No, Grandpa. Well, now you do. Not yelling at him. The, the freaking line when 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 Michael is just kind of ca- trying to trying to totally walk back into the house as invisible as possible, and he's like, "Oh, looks like I wasn't the only one who got lucky tonight," and like stuff like that is just so like, "Oh man, yeah, him, him, <laughs> you know the thing you want to hear Grandpa yeah. say." <laughs> yeah, and, his, and his car horn plays La Cucaracha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they just come like that in California. You have to ask them not to do that. So, <laughs> didn't even think anything was weird about that. Absolutely. And it's just like, you know, there, there's, it, again, there's, I'm shocked that they haven't, because he clearly, he clearly knows. I mean, he, he knew when to show up. Oh, yeah. You know, he, he, he knew the, you know, the person he needed to be targeting to, to, to end, to end everything. So it's just like, okay, Grandpa, are you like the resident vampire killer and you just, you know, you're, you're on the down low about it? Well, I mean, there's so many scenes where he's just like in his taxidermy room, like creepily staring out. <laughs> 
Like, and, and, and it just so happens to cue in with all the scenes where, you know, you know, the boyfriend's coming into the house or, you know, this is happening, you know. And, and so, you know, you're led to believe it's just grandpa being creepy. But the, 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 the cue for me was when he was putting that post in. And instead of putting the, the pointy end of the post down for some reason, he had it straight up in the air. And that's when I was like, oh, I, I think, you know, when I first saw this, I was like, I think I, think I, I, think I know what's yeah. going on here now. Like I think I think Grandpa is on, in on this. Now I didn't I didn't know that that meant that at the end of the movie, of course, he was going to like catapult as many of them as he could at the at the you know head vampire, of course. But but I, I that that cued me in when I saw the pointy end up. It was like it's like oh this is for protection. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I knew something it's, was the, up. Yeah, in the, in the event that vampires are very clumsy and we're going to like trip and impale them yeah. <laughs> before they. Uh, they get into your house. He's not wrong. They are pretty clumsy in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> He's like the blade of this world. <laughs> He's at the very least the whistler. <laughs> Daywalker. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, no. At the end, he's got no regard for that house anymore. Like he doesn't know that the the sinks have exploded and everything like that. He's just gonna drive his car right through the middle. And uh, it's like, I'm insured. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, got that got that sweet vampire insurance. Yeah, great, great, great vampire insurance. I can't do his voice. Anyways. I feel like the sets are really good in this movie. Like all the locations that they film, but it feels like the wind blows through all of them. Like that. Once they start with the vampire effects and the wind, like, that maybe there isn't a back to any of these places. <laughs> well ventilated, every building. Yeah. Well ventilated. <laughs> yep, you gotta, you gotta let that fresh air in, and uh, didn't they say vampires smell bad? Maybe that's all That's all mm. about. They constantly have to have fans blowing on them. I would have loved to gone to that video store, though. That would have been fun. And that, oh, that video store looked amazing. I, I yeah. would have loved to have gone there and the comic book store. Both those places were like, yeah, held my attention, even as a kid watching this movie. I got, I got to nerd out here for a second. They're living on a beach town, you know, yep. like Cliffside here. That that water, that air coming off there has to affect the comics. I mean, they, they got wide, oh, totally. fried, you know, front open gates there. Yep. Like, I don't care if they are bagged and boarded. You know. Oh, but they aren't, clearly. No, as, no, no. You know. As, you know, he's got that rare... Superman number whatever. We're like a stone's throw from the ocean over here, and like the enamel comes off of our cars from like yeah. the seawater. <laughs> that air. was fascinating. Yeah, I like had my car parked here for just over two years. Just the amount of like spots that appeared where the paint like suddenly decided it didn't want to be a part of my car anymore. Okay, well, I guess this is just what happens. <laughs> Nothing I could do. The, co- the price you pay for a beautiful view. That's right. <laughs> it's true. It's like acid wash jeans or something. <laughs> acid wash car. Yeah. <laughs> it's a style at the time. Yeah, beach town car. The only other thing I remember thinking Please. was that when we first watched this, like, a, I don't know if it was four months ago or what. It was a, w- a little while ago. Yeah. We had this moment where I was saying... Because we had just watched the second season of Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. And spoiler alert for anybody who... This isn't that big of a deal. No. Hasn't watched Stranger Things. But there's a character that has this I don't know what going on in it. Yep. And after we watched this movie, I said to Joel, maybe he's supposed to be trying to look like Kiefer Sutherland. <laughs> are you talking, uh, are you talking about Billy? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah, I can see it. I can see it. I They, you know, they, God knows they referenced everything else in the 80s. I mean, they have to, I mean, the Lost Boys would be a bit after right. Stranger Things takes place. But I mean, I mean, even just a, 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 a you know, a subtle reference to it wouldn't 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 be at all surprising. Totally, no, yeah, he I get that. He definitely comes off like a some sort of like maybe he's a vampire, <laughs> maybe he's a serial killer. We don't know. There's something weird about this guy. Yeah, but we haven't talked yeah. to it yet, so <laughs> totally. We'll touch upon that in the third season. He's channeling all of Keeper Sutherland's characters up to that point. Yeah, so yeah, points, definitely, one hundred percent. Something like that. Aaron, anything else you No, I, th- I think we're good. We talked about the comic book store. That was my favorite. Oh, okay. My favorite scenes in this movie, other than you know the, the how how they destroy each of the vampires. That was that was pretty fun. 
Were you already really into comics when you saw this movie, or was it? Like- yeah, it was definitely. I, rem- <laughs> I thought I just I remember that scene when he hands in the comics like I'm gonna give this to you, it might save your life someday. I just thought that was the coolest thing. I, I still do. Yeah, I- <laughs> awesome. Still hasn't. Still, my opinion has not changed on that scene. It's pr- probably super incredibly dorky, of course, but I love it. Like it, it really makes the movie for me in a lot of ways. We don't want any dorkiness in this house. I know. So you need Especially on a yeah. science fiction fantasy horror Absolutely. movie podcast. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Bye, Joel. Bye, Sarah. To a it was nice to meet you, Gina. <laughs> met you too. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I like the amount of dogs in this movie. That's a, that's another thing I want to mention. There are beautiful dogs in this movie. Yeah. It, the, the, the family dog is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Like some sort of husky, I think. Yeah. yeah. Nanook, aka like Nana. like Nana from Peter Pan. Ooh. Mm-hmm. And then Ooh. Uh, Thorn, I think, is a very handsome pup. And then I never really noticed before, but Grandpa's got his own car dog. He does. Mm-hmm. I don't know what kind of dog that one was, but he's got a. I feel like he's just to be a standard mutt. Yeah. Was it, was it also taxidermy? <laughs> I hope not. I think it. Oh no! That's why I was like, it is a cutie, but I think it's sad. It's like a gift for the widow, whatever it is. Nah, dude, it's just—it's just, I don't know it's just his faithful I don't friend. He drives know. around everywhere. Oh, God, <laughs> that's gonna be me someday. That's oh, so no. sad. No. <laughs> 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 what you're gonna be freeze dried or <laughs> yeah, Joel's gonna be taxidermied. I'm gonna be taxidermied in the passenger <laughs> seat of <laughs> Sarah's car. <laughs> you can use a carpool lane whenever you want. I'm sorry, we're way we're going on tangent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything else you want to talk about, Gina? I I love it. Everybody should watch this movie. I mean, it's 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 you know it's gloriously unapologetically 1980s in a in a nutshell, and it it is just everything good and great about a not all that terrific decade. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it would make a perfect get together with all your friends and watch a movie and 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 have a lot of fun that evening type movie. Like, I don't think it's a a background movie necessarily, although it, I mean that's fr- that's perfectly fine to put as a background, but I think it is like it, it's so much fun to watch and uh, you participate in in the goofiness thing. Like if somebody did like a uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show style showing where people are like in the theater, like acting in out and dancing around, and uh, things like that. I think this could work. You know, yeah. I could, we can make it work. Yeah, and it's it's I think it's a it's a good you know movie that you know that has horror elements for people who you know, are not quite into horror but kind of want to be. But it just has a good look to it. But it's not particularly. I mean, I don't think it's scary. I mean, people there there might be some elements that other people will think it's scary, but it's just it's. I, I feel like it's definitely one of those movies where you, you have to be really trying hard to find something to dislike about it. And and frankly, I think that, you know, if you do, it is probably partially because it is meant very much for a young female audience. And and as as Twitter can tell us, people don't tend to like uh, uh, media that is created with young women in mind. So, Man, you know, isn't that I, the I, truth? I, Yikes. Yeah. So I, I don't know how well this movie would have gone over, you know, had it been, you know, well, now, I mean, t- to be fair, you know, now there is, you know, there is more, you know, media created for young women. Now they still get hassled for it. But Absolutely. I think, you know, had social media existed when this came out, it, it would have, you know, resulted in what we see, you know, now in a lot of, you know, you know, when you see like The Last Jedi with a young female character being laid to being made to be the, the main character and people don't like that kind of thing. People don't like when something exists that is not made for them. And and I do I do remember that, you know, you know, male classmates just kind of, you know, just yeah, whatever, lost boys, ha 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 and they just, you know, because it wasn't they perceived it as it wasn't for them. Yeah. What would happen if every time a, a movie by whatever standard is considered a quote unquote regular movie came out, if all the women were just like, this movie's not for me from now on? And yeah. we're like, well, yeah. And I was thinking, stick. like, 
Yeah, and I was thinking, you know, it, as soon as I said that, I just realized Mer- when Twilight was a thing. Yeah. And how how just people just gleefully just just crapped all over it yep. because it was made for girls. It yeah. was made for for young women. And and just, you know, just the 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 gnashing and the wailing and the complaining because these movies were very successful and they were kind of hard to escape and it's like, you know, it's fine if something exists that isn't made for you. Yeah. <laughs> people, just, right. people just can't get past that. And and I think that, you know, again, if social media had existed when this had come out, it would run into the same thing where just by design of, you know, it existing for a very specific type of audience that it would be, it would be dismissed as you know, stupid and not worth your time. Yeah. That's true. I very feel like true. it's a really immature attitude that people have because everyone has their preferences. Maybe they like something, maybe they don't. But I feel like kid, like when you're little and you want to watch something, then you're like, oh, I wish, you know, I wish this was for me if you're a little kid. And it feels like that's just like an immature attitude to yeah. have. Like if you're a, a man saying something doesn't feel like it's for you or, yeah. I mean. Yeah. As women, we always see stuff that is 100% like for a man. Like, yeah. Anyway, not to get all into it. No, no. It makes, it makes perfect <laughs> sense to me. I stand by everything said previously and here that it's, it's a great movie. And if you don't like it because it's for aimed not at your demographic, uh, why don't you go watch something else, you goofus? <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's your loss because it's a great movie. Exactly. It's so exactly. much fun. It is so much fun. <sighs> I feel like it's a cult classic now that's like crosses like gender and everything because it's so famous for its time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, yeah. It, I think it doesn't hurt to be open minded and just be cool with new things coming out. Totally. Yeah, it doesn't hurt not to be lame. Oh, right, right. <laughs> All right. I think we're uh, going to wind it down. <laughs> going to think of our lessons. Mm-hmm. Think of a lesson that What's you that? learned. Sorry, what was that? Oh, no, I was going to say, it seems like a good place to wrap it up. You. We could go on and on and on, but Oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> let's do uh, I, I want. Pe- I want people to listen to this and then turn it off and say, let's go put the Lost Boys on. Yeah. <laughs> That's what always happens to me anyways. Like, somebody mentions it in a podcast, and I'm like, I kind of want to go watch Lost Boys now. <laughs> it's one of those movies. Yeah. It is. Uh, okay, I'm going to read the outro stuff. You guys think of a lesson that you learned from the Lost Boys. Hey, listener, if you want to write in about any particular movie you want us to talk about, or you have any comments about the episode, or you want to tell us about your first time watching Lost Boys, we'd love to hear that story. Write into please don't podcast at gmail.com or message us on Facebook, facebook.com slash PDSMIOS. If you subscribe to us on Apple Podcast or iTunes or whatever the Apple uh, equivalent is, uh, we'd appreciate it if you left us a star and or written rating. Thanks in advance for that. If you want to hear more podcasts like ours, check out eartrumpetaudio.com. You've got lots of good stuff over there. We had a new episode of The Realist Podcast. That's Dave Stone Rob's podcast where he's going through the AFI Top 100 American Films of All Time. Let's see. He did through my own podcast feed to figure this out. Yeah, he just covered One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And that's that had to be a good conversation. That movie is special and full of character actors, and it's, man, I want to talk about it. Let's talk about that one now, guys. All, All right. right. Round two. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it's too sad. It yeah. makes me sad. It is. <laughs> I agree. Gina, where can people hear other uh, pieces of your work? Uh, I am one of the hosts of Kill by Kill, a podcast in which we break down horror movies according to the characters. Uh, as of this right, as of this recording, we are getting cl- ever closer to the end of the remake of Friday the Thirteenth, uh, which will finally, after two years, <laughs> bring us to the end of the Friday the Thirteenth uh, uh, franchise until we come back around to Freddy vs. Jason. 
but you can uh, just look for us under Kill by Kill. I also write about movies and pop culture and old TV at my website at dinaradcliffe.com. Nice. Yeah. I was just listening. Uh, me and Sarah watched Prom Night yesterday. And uh, yes. I just listened to your episode on Prom Night. And I'm, I'm hoping to move on to uh, Hello, Mary Lou after this. Oh, are you in for a treat <laughs> with that one? I'm not, I'm not even being sarcastic. It is insanity. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. All right. You guys, did you think of a lesson? A Lost Boys lesson? I thought of one. All right. Um, The lesson I learned from this movie is the greatest concert-going experience you can ever have is going to see a saxophone player. (laughs) Yeah! um, Who wears just pants and chains. The next time I ever see someone playing the saxophone on stage, Sarah, I promise I'll do a headbang. Yeah. Just for that saxophone player. Yeah. (laughs) And bring a, bring a, like a, I don't know, a, a bottle full of grease and throw it on the stage and be like, take your shirt off. <laughs> I, did, I, did I go to a lot of concerts, but this crowd was more into it than most shows I've ever been. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I've got a lesson too, Sarah. So this lesson is going to relate to our days. And the lesson is be sure to have a physical landline in your house. Because you never know when you're going to, like, I don't know, drink vampire blood and fly out your window. And I know nowadays that this is a a cautionary tale because we all have cell phones now and, you know, a a certain lack of uh, landlines. So none's going to hold you in. That's right. That's true. Yeah. So there you you, go. I mean, there's there's very few tethers in this house when you think about it. (laughs) (laughs) Too many doors, not enough tethers. (laughs) We've had conversations about us accidentally slipping slipping on the stairs or something and flying out the window. So (laughs) this is something we've actually thought about before. (laughs) All right. I have my, my lesson is um, if you are a newly single mother and you are looking to move to a new town, do a little research beforehand. <laughs> you may, maybe go to your local library, use the microfiche machine, check the you know ch- check the local crime beat. Don't don't trust your eccentric father to to know what's going on in the town because chances are he's probably hiding something. Yeah, possibly vampires. <laughs> murder capital of the world is not the best yeah. place yeah I mean you could probably even in a pre-internet world you probably could find out just by you know reading the newspaper or making a few calls whether or not the town you were moving to was in fact the murder capital of the United States yeah well I I think part of the, the cautionary tale of 80s movies is that Moving single moms don't bring your children, especially your sons, to California because you're either going to end up with the Santa Carla with the vampires and bad influences, or you're going to end up like Daniel LaRusso's mom and it's karate capital of the world and he's going to get his ass kicked all over the place. I mean, it's just Cobra Kai, something wrong with California. <laughs> huh? Something going on here. And uh, my lesson is that even though I am an animal lover through and through. There's nothing that makes me more upset than the idea of an animal being harmed. I don't think it's a bad idea not to have uh, some sort of uh, antler set in your house. Just, just in case. Just, just in case. <laughs> hey, it's, his antlers have come in handy in Salem's Lot. Mm. Um, there was a there was a character well, in the book in the the TV movie the. Uh, not in the book, but in the TV movie, someone was uh, was killed with antlers. Uh, it was used to a uh, memorable effect in Silent Night, Deadly Night. Mm. And it was actually used in um, a topical for me, the Friday the 13th remake. So so the antler kill is, is a thing, uh, apparently. <laughs> yeah, my, my favorite TV show, Hannibal, also had some very prominent antler stuff going on. Oh, that's a good idea. Thanks for being on, Gina. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. This was so much fun. Thank you so much, Thanks Gina. Thanks for guesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really had a good time watching this movie and talking about yeah, it. Yeah, same here. And How can you not? It's yeah. just so great. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you next week, folks. Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 Bye.
EarTrumpetAudio.com Ideas and entertainment. Loud and clear. Mm-hmm. <laughs>